Well, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And that's why we're here. We've gathered together to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus and to invite anyone and everyone to put their faith and their trust and their hope in Him. For life is found in Jesus Christ alone. Could I get an amen in the house? Amen. Well, it's great to see you. I tell you, it was like a family reunion for me when I walked in the door and got to embrace so many friends that I've known over the years and people who have been such a blessing and an encouragement in my life. And so thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity just to get to reconnect here and to get to see so many special friends as well. And Miss Sheila, we thank God that you're here today. Amen. So many people have been praying for you, and we were actually uh, last week in Thailand and praying for you from there. Did you know God can even answer prayers from Thailand? Amen. Amen. And so we're thankful to all that God is doing in this church family, using your pastor and this church to touch a world that deeply and desperately needs to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, by the way, this time next Sunday... I will be in Havana, Cuba, and I'll be preaching there. We're taking the team there, spend a week there. Listen, I know that Cuba is a communist country, but God is moving in that communist country. And people are coming to know the Lord Jesus, and the churches are growing and expanding, and God's doing a great work there. So I would deeply appreciate your prayers as we get ready to go, and we'll spend a week there next week. Uh, the pastor contacted me uh, just a few days ago and he said, we are inviting 300 lost people to come to the service where you're going to be preaching and then we're going to feed them all after the service. And so if you pray, a great evangelistic opportunity and then during the week we'll be out in the community knocking on doors, visiting in homes, uh, preaching in house churches and just sharing the message of God's love and forgiveness in our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you pray for us, I'd appreciate that. I tell people everywhere I go, I need the prayer and you need the practice. Amen. Amen. So, so we appreciate that. All right. Well, my assignment this morning is to get us to the Word of God. And so if you have your Bibles, let me invite you to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. I'll read down through verse 6. And then for the sake of time, we'll jump across the page and pick up at verse 12 and read to verse 13. I'll help you make the jump, all right? Now, if you are physically able, I'm going to ask that you stand with me for the reading of of God's inspired, infallible, ever-living Word. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of our great God. And it is worth standing for. Amen. This is what the Word of God says. Paul the Apostle, inspired by God's Holy Spirit, writes these words when he says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jump to verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Hey, let's take a moment and pray together, shall we? And then we will jump into this marvelous 
passage of scripture. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church and what it stands for. And how, Lord, we rejoice today with the people of God for raising up dear Sheila and bringing her back to the house of the Lord with the people of God where she can sing and worship and pray and praise. Thank you for our pastor, Lord. We pray your hand mighty on his life and his family as he leads this congregation. And then, Lord, personally, I want to thank you for so many special friends, a part of this church in this service today, who have been such a, an important part of my own spiritual journey, who have loved me and prayed for me and encouraged me and my family over the years. Lord, I love them, and I thank you for them. Now, Lord, take a simple preacher and some brief moments together and use your word to speak eternity into our lives. Lord, for somebody here today who's never come to know the love of God, the forgiveness of sins, and Jesus Christ is Lord, we pray that today will be that day of salvation. And we'll give you the praise in advance. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, and the people of God said, amen. amen and amen, and God bless you and be seated. You know, when I read that passage of scripture, it reminds me of a story I read just recently about a young mother with four children, and the ages of her children, two, four, six, and eight exactly two years apart. Now, any mother with children will tell you a mother with children those ages is a busy mother. Could I get an amen from the ladies in the house? Well, this dear mother was caring for the needs of her children. She watched them as they were playing their games and entertaining each other, and so she decided it would be a good time just to slip out on the front porch, tidy up a bit, water some of the flowers, put things away, but while she was doing that, she noticed it had become strangely quiet in the house. <laughs> now she's wondering why it is so quiet in the house. And so she decided to go in and check on the children. And when she did, she found the children in a semicircle. These children had gone out into the backyard while she was on the front porch found a family of skunks <laughs> and brought them in the house. Now they are seated in a circle around the skunks. They're playing with the skunks. Mama flew into a panic. And she shouted, children, everybody run. And so each child grabbed a skunk and they went running <laughs> through the house. You know, it never does any good to panic, does it? <coughs> and yet we live in a world right now that is filled with panic. Could I get an amen? amen. Every article that we read, every news bulletin that comes through our <coughs> phone, however it is that you get your news, the, the world is filled with pandemonium and panic. If anybody had a reason to panic, it would have been the man who wrote this passage of Scripture. Let me remind you of where he is when he writes these words of comfort and encouragement and hope. The Apostle Paul, this man of God, this great evangelist, soul winner, missionary, church planter, probably the greatest missionary voice that God ever placed on this planet. And yet now he is a prisoner of Rome. He's writing this book as a prisoner of in a Roman dungeon. This is what they've done. They've locked him up, they've thrown away the key, and they have left him there to rot and die. And yet in those dark, dismal circumstances, the Apostle Paul would write words like this, Philippians 4.13, For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Where does he find that kind of strength? Where does he find that kind of endurance? Why, he's going to tell us right here in these opening verses of Scripture. Some things that become anchors for our soul in times of distress and trouble and discouragement. And folks, let's be honest. 
If we live on this planet very long, every one of us are going to go through those kinds of times. Amen. Amen. Some of you are there right now. Some of you have just come through some turbulent days. The truth is we're all going to face the difficulties. When we do, what do we do? Well, the scripture gives us some beautiful truth to be an anchor for our soul in those times of struggle and difficulty. Paul would remind us, first of all, that we have the presence of a holy God. You see, our Lord has promised that he will never leave us and never forsake us. And Paul reminds us in that passage, he's writing to this church and he says, listen, right here in this dungeon, I'm praying for you. By the way, notice what he prays. He doesn't pray for his own release. I'm telling you, if it were me in a Roman dungeon, if it were me in any jail, anywhere, I'd be praying, Lord, get me out of here. Now, don't look at me as if you wouldn't pray that prayer. <laughs> Every one of us would be praying, Lord, get me out of here. Bring my release. Somebody make some phone calls. Somebody contact important people and get me out of this place. Not Paul. Right there in the midst of this dungeon, he's not praying for his own needs. He's praying for the needs of others. He's praying for this church. He's praying for their, their progress in the gospel. He's praying for them. What do you pray for when you face the difficulties and the trials and the problems and the heartaches? Well, we already have God's promise that he will never leave us and never forsake us. Here's what Paul could say. Paul can say, look, you can lock me up, you can throw away the key, and you can separate me from my friends and my family and my ministry and everything that's dear to me in this world. But let me tell you what you can never do. You can never lock me out of the presence of my God. Amen. What a truth. What an anchor. And he's always with us. Our, our hearts yearn for the presence of God. We were made for the presence of God. And nothing outside of His presence in our lives satisfies the deep needs of the human heart. And so He's promised us the presence of God. May I remind you today, I don't know what you're dealing with, what you're going through, but I want to tell you, dear friend, you are not alone. Just about a month ago, we were in the country of Turkey, and if you've been following the news, you know that back in February, Turkey was shaken by a, a mighty earthquake. They say that some 50,000 people died initially from that earthquake. Hundreds of others would die as a result of injuries. People have lost their homes, their businesses, their livelihood. We joined a small team, and we went to Turkey and went into those tent cities where people are trying to manage a life. And we were able to go into these tents and into these makeshift shelters. And as the message would reach their hearts, we would simply say, look, we have come in the name of Jesus Christ to remind you you're not alone and you're not forgotten. And as we would share that message, the tears would begin to flow. Why? Because every one of us want to know we're not forgotten. Amen. Amen. And we're not alone. There's a God in heaven who stands with his people. We've got the presence of God. But not only that, we've got the promise of God. Now, now you know that the Bible is a book of promises. It is filled with promises. One after another. From Genesis to Revelation, God has given promise after promise after promise to his people. And by the way, did you know that God never breaks a promise? Amen. Now, I've broken a few in my day. How about you? I didn't get a single amen. <laughs> now, we've all broken some promises. Didn't mean to, didn't want to. Circumstances beyond our control, and we broke a promise or two. Our Lord has a perfect record of keeping his promise. Now, there's a great promise in verse 6. If you didn't see it, Paul would remind us of this great promise of God, especially in the difficulties. He says in that passage that the God who saved us 
is going to bring us to completion. In other words, he's going to finish the work that he started in us. God's going to complete the work. You see, the moment you said one eternal yes to Jesus Christ, you became a part of the family of God. Amen. Amen. And when that happened, he started working in you and working on you so that finally and ultimately you will bear the image of his son. That's always been God's plan and purpose for our lives. That we might be like Jesus. We might bear his image. But let's be honest. There are times when I look at my life and it's not a whole lot like Jesus. This is not a good time for an amen. <laughs> the only person allowed to give an amen right now is my wife, okay? Because she lives with me and she knows. There are times I am not like Jesus Christ. I'm not all that I ought to be. But then I come across that promise and I can say, bless God. This isn't the finished product. See, God's not done with me yet. Listen, if you don't think that I'm all that I ought to be, it's okay. Because he's not done yet. Amen. He's still working in me and on me until finally and ultimately I will be like my blessed Lord Jesus. And so will you. Amen. So he's in the process of remaking us day by day. Do you all ever watch those, uh, those shows where they flip houses? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Can I see a hand? Yeah. I hate those shows. <laughs> and here's why. Because my wife is watching. <laughs> and when the show is over, she'll say, you know, babe, we could do that in our kitchen. <laughs> we, we could take that garage and we could... And she's already making plans on what it's going to... Listen, I've got more unfinished projects in my house than I can begin to count. I am great at starting projects. <laughs> Somebody's on my page. <laughs> Where I have trouble is completing the project. Here's the good news. God always finishes what he starts. Right. Amen. Amen. And he is going to complete the work he started in you when you placed your faith and your trust and your hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. He that started a good work in you, the Bible says, will bring it to completion. That's a good place for an amen. amen. So we've got his presence never going to leave us. Never going to forsake us. We've got his promise that in every situation in our lives, he is working that for our good and his glory to make us, to conform us into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. But do you know there's another great truth in that passage? Another anchor for our soul in the difficult times? There's his purpose. He tells us all the way over there in verse 12. That's why we skipped over to verse 12. When he says, I want you to know, brethren, the things that happened to me have actually turned out to further or advance the gospel. Now, hold on, wait a minute, time out. What thing is this Paul talking about? The things that happened to me. Remember where he is. He's in jail. He's locked up. He's incarcerated. He's a prisoner. He's no longer able to travel, to preach, to proclaim, to start churches. All those things that he had been doing up to this time. And yet he's still able to say that the things that have happened to me, being locked up in a prison, left to die, it's actually turned out to advance the kingdom. And you've got to scratch your head and say, hold on, wait a minute, Paul. How does that happen? You can't travel. You're a prisoner. You have no freedom. Here's what Paul would say. This is what the Bible says. He says, the whole palace guard has become aware that my chains are in Christ. What's he talking about? 
Well, Bible scholars tell us that every day for 12 hours at a watch, this great man of God, soul winner, evangelist, missionary, would be chained to Roman soldiers who were sent to guard him. Are y'all with me? Do you know what's going to happen for the next 12 hours while these men are chained to this mighty soul winner? You see, they think Paul is their prisoner. Oh, no. <laughs> they are Paul's prisoner. And for the next 12 hours, he preaches to them about the kingdom of God, about the love of Jesus Christ, about his sacrifice on the cross, about his glorious resurrection and his soon return. Paul is not their prisoner, dear friend. They are Paul's prisoners. And he begins to blast them with the gospel day after day after day. Well, you know what eventually happens. While these men, after hearing the word of God 12 hours every day without end, after a period of time, one of those old hardened Roman soldiers says, Paul, I've got to tell you, I can't stand this any longer. I can't even sleep at night because I fear I'm under the judgment of God. Paul, please tell me, how can I be saved? How can I miss the judgment of God? How can I receive forgiveness of sins? And Paul will lead one Roman soldier and another and another Amen. and another until he can say the whole palace guard, every single one of these Roman soldiers has heard the message of Jesus Christ. And Paul would say, not a single one of them is getting away. They are chained to my body so that I can proclaim to them the gospel. You see how God has flipped that story? See, the church would be looking at Paul saying, Poor old Paul, let's pray for Paul. These are dark days for Paul. And Paul could say, I'm having the time of my life. Winning these Roman soldiers to Jesus Christ. An opportunity I would have never had if I had not been locked up in this prison. Do you see how God flipped it? You see how God turned what was a bad situation and is, and is using it for the good of the kingdom of God? You know he's going to do that in your life as well? You look back and you say, oh my goodness, how in the world did I end up here? Why am I going through what I'm going through? Why these struggles? Why these setbacks? Why this difficulty? Why this heartache? Why this pain? And behind it all, folks, God's working out His plan and His purpose for your life and the lives of others who will be touched by you through what you're going through. That's a good place for an amen. amen. Paul would say, here's my anchors. Right here in the middle of this prison, I've got God's presence. He's here with me. I'm praying, seeking His face, and knowing His presence. I've got His promise. He is using this situation to conform me into the image of His Son. I've got His purpose that even in the darkest times, God is going to have His way and get His glory through what I am walking through. One final thing I want you to see in that passage. Paul would say, in the midst of all of this struggle, in the midst of all this trouble, trouble, <coughs> I have his people. Hey, I want you to listen to what Paul says. We didn't read it a moment ago. Let me read it to you now. Verse 8. For God is my witness, how greatly... I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, I got a family. I've got a family called the family of God. And when I think about this family, when I am reminded of this family of God, it brings me comfort, it brings me joy. It brings me encouragement. 
See, folks, what we do here this morning, I mentioned it when I first started. I came through that door a while ago, and I got so many hugs and so many embraces and so many handshakes and so many good to see yous and so many you haven't changed at all. You look the same as you did 30 years ago. Uh, to be honest, nobody said that. All right. <laughs> But the encouragement, the fellowship, the joy of just being with the family. Amen. You know, that's what we are. We're the family of God. God's people. And may I just remind you on the authority of God's truth. Folks, we need each other. Huh? Amen? Amen. We I need to be here. Whether I'm preaching or not, I need to be here. I need to be with you. We need to be together. You know, one of the hardest things about COVID was we couldn't gather together. Yeah, I know we watched YouTube and FaceTime. And I, I know we did all of that. But it wasn't the same as being together. Amen. Amen. Watching a screen is not the same as shaking a brother's hand or hugging someone's neck and saying, man, it is great to see you and be together. We need each other, folks. We need the family. We need the encouragement, the support, the prayers. I cannot tell you what it means to me personally, what it means to my family, what it means to our ministry when I get a note or a card or a text or an email, when I'm getting ready to go on some trip somewhere and people just simply say, hey, we're thinking about you and we're praying for you and we stand with you. See, that's family. Amen. Amen. That's family you now. And how desperately we need each other. But especially during those times when we struggle, when we hurt, when there's grief, when there's sorrow, when there's pain, when there are doubts, when there are questions that we can't get answers for. Those are the times we need this family the most. You see, the truth is, not a single one of us got where we are spiritually all by ourselves. Amen. God has put people in your life who have loved you, prayed for you, encouraged you, walked with you to get you where you are today. And now as God's people, we get to do that for somebody else. Somebody else who's hurting. Somebody else who's wounded. Somebody else who's walking through sorrow. We get to come alongside them and say, hey, you're not alone. There's a God who loves you. And there's a brother or a sister in Christ who loves you. And like you all have been saying to Miss Sheila for weeks now, You've got a whole church family that loves you, that stands with you, and that's praying for you. Folks, that's the family of God. Amen. That's the family. Amen. In my drawer at home, I have a file that is filled with notes and cards that I've received over the years that have come to me so much to me. Somebody wrote a note to say thank you. You prayed for me at a very difficult time. Thank you. You walked with me through heartache and sorrow. Thank you. It helped bring a family member to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, that's a treasure for me. Do that for somebody 